Donald Trump won last night in the did. New Hampshire uh, primary. We are going to be talking now to Nigel Farage to get his reaction uh, just before we talk to Stephen Pound and Mike Parry. Good morning, Nigel. Hello. Looking very well still after your stint in the jungle. You've not put back put on any of that weight, have you? You look fabulous. Um, right. Donald Trump won last night. Not really a surprise. No. I mean, look, he's got fanatical support amongst the Republican base. If there was one state in which he might do badly, it was New Hampshire, because it wasn't just registered Republicans voting. Independents could vote in that primary as well. And he's still 11, 12 points ahead of Nikki Haley. Uh, I honestly can't understand what she thinks she's got to gain by going on to her home state, 24 February, and probably being beat by 30 points. So, look, the nomination is Trump's. It's kind of all over. I suppose, is she fighting in a sense, Nigel, for next time round? Because she must know she can't win. Is she trying to position herself for four years' time? She may be trying to position herself for four years' time, but, you know, it's not a good thing to upset the base, is it? It's not a good thing to make the base think, look, we've got to turn out. You know, when Super Tuesday comes up on March 5th, where a dozen states are voting, um, she's got to be very, very careful not to damage a reputation long term. Mm. Now, Joe, we want to also, while you're here, talk about this story that's uh, in the papers today about the fact that if we go to war, uh, the, the head of the army is saying that, that the public might be called up to go and fight for the country. We've got a Twitter poll running and there's a very much 60-40 uh, at the moment. I thought it might be more saying I wouldn't go and fight for this lot under no circumstances. I'd like to see them on the front line. What's your take on this issue? Because it does raise something actually quite important, doesn't it? Well, I think there are two things to say. I mean, the first thing is, if you perceive a threat to your family, your country, your way of life, and that threat appeared to be direct, then I think you might have a very different point of view. But the other worry I've got is, what about all these people marching in the streets of London the pro-Palestinian demonstrators who seem to object to everything we've stood for ever since the Balfour Declaration in 1917. I mean, if we call those people up, what do we do when they refuse? So I think this is quite complex. I, mean, I think the real answer is not to keep reducing the size of the army, the Air Force and the Navy in the way in which we are. Mm. Do you think he's kite flying on behalf of the government? Because it's quite an unusual um, I, intervention. Mm. I, I don't know. No, I think what he's doing is playing quite a clever game, actually. I think what he's saying is, look, you are cutting our services down to a level at which we cannot meet basic commitments, let alone go to war. So let's frighten the population. Let's get a negative reaction. And maybe then the government might just start to rebuild our forces. And it is, Andrew, extraordinary. 14 years of conservative rule the extent to which they degraded all three of the armed services. And, and you used to think about the Conservatives were always seen as tough on immigration, tough on defence, and they've lost their way on both. Mm. Well, options for change 30 years ago under John Major saw the biggest uh, peacetime yeah. cut since 1961 in terms of the size of the army in particular uh, and the amalgamation of many historic regiments. Um, and we've had the same process again under a Conservative government this time round. Um, whether Keir Starmer's defence policy would be more robust remains to be seen. We spoke earlier, Nigel, to Rear Admiral Chris Parry, who was saying that he thinks that China, North Korea, Russia are already on a war footing mm. because they smell blood in a weakened West. I, I wasn't entirely convinced by his argument for that. Are you? Oh, absolutely. I think Chris is dead right. I mean, look, I think the signal was the withdrawal of the last 3,000 American troops from Afghanistan. They weren't there in a fighting. No American soldier had been killed in the previous 18 months. They were training and helping the Afghan army fight the Taliban. Biden, without any reference to us or the NATO allies, withdrew those troops. We saw the fall of Kabul, Taliban back in charge. And before you know it, Putin has decided to invade Ukraine. Weak Western leadership has contributed a huge amount to where we are in the world today. 
Um, talking of wars, uh, your colleague Richard Tice, of course, we're going to speak to him a little later, he's in Ukraine, he's taken a great convoy of military aid there. Are we going to see you uh, in a convoy to Ukraine taking military aid, Nigel? I don't think so, um, Andrew, no. Good for Richard. If that's what people want to do, I think good for them. Um, I, I just have this feeling about the Ukraine war that nobody in a position of global authority seems to have even considered the option Maybe we can stop death on a massive scale and maybe sit down and start to have some negotiation. Mm, OK. All right. Thank you, Nigel. Good to see you. I uh, presume you're on the telly at 7 o'clock tonight, as always, are you? Yes, back today. Absolutely. Brilliant. Well, I look forward to it. Nigel Farage. Um, in the studio, I wonder if Stephen Pound would join him, because you were in the Merchant Navy, Stephen, as a young man, which was many years ago, obviously. Royal. The Royal oh, Navy. Oh, you were the Royal Navy. Navy. Yeah. Of course yeah, you were. I wasn't, I wasn't um, read Dustin. Um, yeah. can, yeah. uh, can I just take exception yeah. to something I just heard mm -hmm. about your Twitter poll when you said that people said that they uh, would not fight for this lot? Politicians are temporary. They come and they go. The love of your country, the love, the patriotic love mm. you feel for your country is eternal and perpetual. And so don't ever confuse your country, your nation, the heartland, the thing that beats within your body with politicians. That actually demeans patriotism and it demeans the sense of duty that I think runs right through this country still. And there is no, I can't think of a, almost a single example of how the younger generation coming up, even my generation, have been taught to love this country growing up. You don't hear, uh, God save the king, as it is now. You never see a Union Jack flag. If you put a Union Jack flag up, you're considered to be some sort of well, crazy that, racist. The fact that taxi driver had. The taxi driver, exactly. We, we've shied away from this idea of Britishness with the pursuit of multiculturalism, which is not all bad. Mm -hmm. But we've shied away from it. And it's only at a time like this you go, well, this is the consequence. You've got a whole I generation. Totally agree with you. Are, are you with I'm me, Mike? Mike Perry, too. I totally, not totally agree. I mean, let's, let's, let's bring these two stories together. Yeah. If there was a case now where you were asked to volunteer to fight for your country, I despair at how many young people would actually answer the call. My father joined the Navy when he was 17 in 1940. He couldn't wait to get out of the Birkenhead Institute, get down to the recruiting office and get aboard a Royal Navy ship. I don't think that response would happen today Not for two reasons. Firstly, young people have a completely different attitude to the very nature of working. Do you know what I mean? Mm. You know, the idea that, oh, no, as soon as you finish school, you get a job and you pay the mortgage. They don't know about that anymore. They want to say, look at all sorts of other options mm. in life. But secondly, as Bev just pointed out, I don't see any patriotism in even middle-aged people in this country. You know, I, what I see is wokeness has been in the news for the last two or three days. I see wokeness everywhere. I see an excuse for people to think the worst of our country and not the best of our country. Yeah. Yeah. And that is going to damage us enormously if we have to stand up and be counted. Well, I think he's right, isn't he? Well, I, I don't know. I mean, this, this is exactly the same debate that took place in 1937, 1938. There was that famous debate in the Oxford Union. There was. This House would not fight for King and, and, they, and they carried it. And, and they carried it. And even von, von Ribbentrop immediately sent a cable to Berlin. Yeah. And he, he said, you know, the British are weakening. Look, uh, one of the things that was interesting about 2005, was a thing called Armed Forces Day, on the 23rd of June. Right. And I don't know about round your way, but where, where I am in West London, we celebrate Armed Forces Day, not in a glorification or a jingoistic way, but out of respect for our armed I'm services. To hear that. Armed, but I, I genuinely think that if push comes to shove, the, the British people will not not let us down. They will be. They, I but understand. do you think it would depend whether we felt imperiled in our own country, like we might have done over German Nazi Germany, well, as opposed to fighting a war you, no, no, in no, Russia? Hang, hang on a second. Against we Russia. weren't imperiled in. 1939. Poland was in peril in yeah. 1939. We had a, a, a mutual support pact with Poland. They'd have, come after, said, they'd have come after us. Well, yeah. would, uh, you know that and I know that. But do you remember mm. you know, a far-off country of which we know little? Yeah. Mm. That was said at the time. We kept but for the best possible reasons to actually support the Poles against the Nazis. Sure. Of course it spread. But, I, I mean, Admiral Perry, I mean, I served under him in Northumberland not Did enough, you? about 30 yeah. years ago. Very, very, he was commander, uh, uh, captain of HMS Northumberland. Marvellous chap. Real, real intellect. But I, I think he's slightly over-egging it here. Mm. I mean, I think there are threats. North Korea is a threat. Iran is a threat. You know, we, we know, you know, Russia is certainly a threat. And our response can't be to militarise and to oppose it, mm. because that simply plays into their hands.